Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn McCauley. Thank you for your patience this evening. Um, I'm the author and speaker events manager here at Sixth and I. And on behalf of all of us and our partner, Politics and Prose Bookstore, I want to welcome everyone here in person and all of you watching from home. Thank you for spending your night with us and supporting a nonprofit and independent bookstores. I also want to thank our promotional partner, Hyas, for supporting tonight's event and to welcome their community. For those who may be new to Sixth and I, we're a center for arts, entertainment, ideas, and Jewish life. For the past 18 years and within this historic sanctuary dating back to 1908, our mission has been to inspire more meaningful and fulfilling lives through an unexpected mix of experience that embrace the multifaceted identities of those we serve. It is truly my honor to welcome Abdul Razak Gurna, who has traveled from England to be with us this evening to celebrate the US release of his 10th novel, Afterlives. Long admired as one of the world's most profound and compassionate narrators of the colonial and post-colonial experience, Mr. Gurna attained a well-deserved level of global prominence last year when he won the 2021 Nobel Prize in Literature. Born and raised in Zanzibar, he is the first black writer to win the prize since it was awarded to Toni Morrison in 1993, and only the fourth to win the prize in its 120 year history. Afterlives, which is the first of Mr. Gurna's novels to be published in the US in decades, is a sweeping multi-generational saga of displacement, loss, and love set against the brutal colonization of East Africa by Germany in the early 20th century. It is simultaneously a globe-spanning, high-level account of colonialism and an intimate view into daily village life. By spotlighting an overlooked historical period in a less considered corner of the world, the novel illuminates a legacy of dislocation that is still present today. In the words of Washington Post book critic Ron Charles, Mr. Gurna's storytelling is an act of resistance against colonialism's efforts to homogenize and erase. I was emotionally affected reading this book. You will hope alongside Afia for the return of her long lost brother Ilias, feel the romance bloom between two young lovers and be devastated by the brutal effects of colonialism on these characters and their communities. Afterlives transcends national and historical boundaries to deliver a strikingly resonant tale that will stay with you. Tonight, Abdul Razak Gurna will be in conversation with Tope Falarin, the executive director of the Institute for Policy Studies, the Lannan visiting lecturer in creative writing at Georgetown University, and the author of the novel, A Particular Kind of Black Man. Later in the program, we'd love to hear your questions and you'll be invited to line up at the microphones in either aisle. Following the event, signed books from both authors will be for sale in the main lobby. And with the hope for good help for every good health for everyone in the audience here tonight, we thank you for keeping your mask on during the event. Thank you all so much for coming out and tuning in tonight. And please give Abdul Razak Gurna and Tope Falaran a warm welcome to Six and I. Thank you. Uh, wonderful to be here. I want to thank all of you for coming to this conversation. And it's such a pleasure to meet you. Uh, you too. I really enjoyed reading this. Um, but before we start about the book, I just want to ask how you're doing. I know you're in the middle of a, this kind of <laughs> whirlwind experience. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah? Going well. <laughs> well, I mean, what do you expect me to say? <laughs> it's a struggle, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I'm looking for some honesty. So it's, it, it's been a lot, I imagine. No, kind no, of... no. It's great. It's yeah. fine. It's yeah. fine. It's fine. Cool. Um, I'm wondering, so I, I first encountered your work as a graduate student, and I'll talk a bit about that later. But I'm wondering uh, if this award, this honor, has altered the way you think about your work because one thing that I've noticed uh, in the aftermath of you getting the Nobel is that now 
a number of people are summarizing your work and they're reducing the kind of scope of your work to a couple sentences. You know, it's about this or it's about that, it's about colonialism or it's about the response to colonialism. Um, has this kind of moment in your life altered the way that you think about the work you've produced over your career? No, not at all. Uh, if anything, I suppose um, occasionally uh, I'm surprised with, um, or by rather, I'm surprised by the fact that something that I had kind of put in there has actually been seen and recognized. I don't take the, uh, I mean, I think I, sp I suppose you're referring to the, um, the citation of the Nobel yep. Committee. Uh, and I kind of sympathize with them in some way because um, I think I have an idea of the process that uh, they went through, or they go through rather, I should say, uh, to make their selection. But, uh, but then in the end, uh, there are 18 or 20 of them, and they discuss and they all have to agree. And then in the end, somebody or two of them are appointed to produce two paragraphs, <laughs> which uh, give, I suppose, a sense of what it was that made the committee make that choice. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I sort of sympathize with them and I, um, I think what they end up saying perhaps is that this is the thing that made the biggest impression on us. Um, I take it like that rather than it's a way of saying this is like the, you know, uh, an accurate summary or digest of something or the other. But then um, when others, particularly I suppose the people who have to write about these things, uh, journalists or literary journalists as well as news journalists, um, maybe who are not as familiar as they would like to be with the, world, the thing that they're talking about, then that becomes something that uh, they turn to as a way of, uh, of speaking about my work. So it kind of sticks, and things stick like that, things yeah. uh, when people say things. But I know for sure that um, people who speak to me about what they have read know very well that that is only one aspect of sure. what the writing's about. Yeah. I want to follow up on that. Um, so as you think about the work you've produced, again, the 10 novels, uh, a lot of criticism and the rest of it, um, do you sense a through line in your work? Do I? Do you sense a through line? Do you sense like a big major theme or a couple of themes or topics in your work? Or perhaps another way of asking it this is, do you, as you think about your career and you sit down to write, do you have in mind something you wish to communicate in your books? Yeah, but again, I suppose it's not something I can, I can attempt to make a list or a kind of like, uh, not, not list as lines or paragraph here and there. Um, it also depends when, when it is in the writing career of, you know, nearly, I don't know, 40 years or something now. Uh, it, the focus changes, I don't mean changes um, unrecognizably, Mm -hmm. But uh, at, there are certain times when uh, um, issues, this issue or that issue is more important than, uh, than later. But I guess I would say that certainly when I started, in addition to just wanting to understand things better, and writing was a good way of doing that, um, both for myself, I think, and also because I did have a sense that I'm writing about something which has not been addressed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking in particular about the way that uh, what, what um, a writing from Africa, African writing, African literature, whatever, uh, how people who discussed it, talked about it, or even received it, um, were had a certain idea of uh, what that meant. Yeah. Um, and I felt that however, how interesting and powerful it was, it wasn't, it wasn't my world, as it were. It wasn't the, the Africa or the part of Africa, or in any case, the Africa that I knew about or, or had grown up about. In other words, 
I felt there was something absent from this idea of what yeah. is made up of this. So, in a way, it was important and, and to be in the early days of my, my career as a writer. That was important to me to try and say, well, look, you know, these are things that, uh, that are not uh, spoken about or written about or known about. So, I said that writing was useful to me for myself as a way of understanding things, but I also felt that there was this other way of thinking or of seeing the world that wasn't, uh, that wasn't known. So it's, it's, I think it's very good for, for a writer to have a sense that I'm, I'm doing something that nobody else is doing. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> but, but, you know, so that was that. Then I also became very interested in... Um, I became much more interested in colonialism later and the way that uh, that the, the both the encounter but also the failures of uh, our societies and I'm thinking when I say our I mean our I don't mean in some kind of generalizing way sure. about the mm -hmm. whole continent but in the way that our societies were kind of overwhelmed by the experience of colonialism or how they were overwhelmed and how they were not, if you like, you know, in what ways they were. And so, go on, go on, go on. This leads me to, to the kind of things I'm interested more in the l later fiction, <clears throat> which is really kind of like about survival and um, coping with um, traumatic events and dramas. So, I don't know, I think I've given you a, yeah, I think a, so good, well. a good list. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I, so I was watching your Nobel lecture a few days ago for the second or third time, and I was struck by, and I think if all of you should watch it if you have a chance, it's a really wonderful, resonant lecture. Um, there's a moment in that lecture when you talk about uh, your experience as a, as a school, uh, when you were in school and you were writing for the first time, as your teacher sort of says, okay, it's time to write, and you're a student, and you and your classmates uh, sort of bend over your desks and begin to write, and how I think that's when you began to sense that perhaps there was something special about this activity. You later talk about um, the moment when you will become a teacher, and you ask your students to do the same. Um, I, I'm, w I'm wondering when you figured out that writing was your medium. Um, so there's a difference, I think, between uh, thinking, I enjoy this activity, this is something that I like to do. And you've just spoken about uh, how you started writing because um, you were trying to figure out, uh, you know, your past. Uh, I know that you grew up in Zanzibar. You left when you were 18 because of the revolution. You find yourself in England. You've said in many places that you began to write because you were trying to figure out what had happened to you uh, to write back to home in a way. When did you begin to sense that not only that writing was your medium, but that this was something that you were, you were good at? <laughs> <laughs> Not that last bit, no. no, no. <laughs> I try to sneak in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I did, I did as you say, as in, I, did al I always did enjoy writing, um, but it wasn't uh, something that I thought I would do as a career kind of thing. And even when I found myself doing it on a regular, basis, as it were, that is to say, coming home from work. In those days, I was working at the hospital um, and coming home from work and somehow they other still finding the energy to sit um, uh, and write things. Um, and especially once I felt there was a thread as well, once there was something mm -hmm. um, like a story or something building up. I suppose that's when I thought, maybe, maybe I'll give this a try. Um, but it was still a secret. Uh, what I mean by that is that it seemed like um, it's a very big thing to aspire to. Um, and uh, when I say it's a secret, I suppose you're afraid of somebody bursting into laughter if you said, this is, this, this is what I'd like to do. In fact, yeah. they did. Uh, <laughs> when I weakened enough to actually say it to somebody, and they did, they laughed. <laughs> <You're just laughs> seriously? <laughs> like that. <laughs> So I thought, whoops, okay, don't, don't say that again. 
Keep it a secret. Keep yeah. it a secret, <laughs> yeah. But then also it took a long time, and this is not unique to me, of course, but it took a long time for um, what became Memory Departure, my first novel, to be published. So it most certainly didn't, didn't think, I'm good at this. <laughs> because even if you did, as the months and years passed, you think, well, maybe I'm not as good <laughs> as I thought I was. But, but obviously you have to believe that um, there is something worth doing, worth not just for yourself, but for your loved ones, for your, you know, everybody else, that they have to shh, be quiet, you know, that kind of thing. To put people through all of that and then it's a load of rubbish, you know. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you must, I suppose, have a sense that it's worth doing. And also to keep doing it. I think that once you start, or once I started, um, then it became an investment. You, you're giving something of your life to it. Then you've, you've got to give it serious attention to see if it would work or not before uh, giving up. Well, but fortunately, of course, it didn't come to that. But, but I imagine that, the, that it must be so that people, uh, if, if they aspire to that and put their minds and hearts into it, but it doesn't work, then at some point you must have to yeah. say, well, maybe not. What kept you going? Um, I guess because I was also doing other things. And I think I probably did believe that... Um, there is something it's necessary to, to say. Um, and occasionally I even thought this is an important thing that I'm doing. Yeah. But, um, but it's all mixed up between that and a uh, sort of loss of confidence and belief and so on. You can't keep it up over I don't know how many years uh, without having those doubts, yeah. that uncertainty about... Um, about this, whether anybody will ever uh, want to do this, um, to look at this. And it's so strange, uh, because uh, eventually I sent my uh, manuscript to Jonathan Cape, mm -hmm. who at that time, um, uh, publishing has changed a lot in these last whatever, 35, 40 years. But at that time, Jonathan Cape in England, anyway, were probably the best publisher, I mean, in the sense of the writers they published, uh, in, of fiction of a certain kind, anyway. Yep. Uh, you name it, they had them, you know? So I thought, right. So, and the, the reason I didn't send it to them over all those years of struggle, was, I suppose, because I thought, well, suppose they say no. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then what do I do? So I think, yeah. oh, all right, all right. Then everybody else has said no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here you are. <laughs> now it's your turn to say no. And they said yes. And, wow. and then everything after that seemed to go okay. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, did you have, were you writing to anyone? I mean, so let me, let me clarify that. Did you have like a literary heroine or hero that you were... That, that inspired you throughout this moment? Somebody uh, who you felt was perhaps, you've mentioned already that you felt that you were writing um, in a way that nobody else was, writing about a topic that nobody else was addressing. But were you, did you see yourself as a part of a tradition? In that moment? Uh, I don't know if I saw myself as part of a tradition exactly. <coughs> the writers I admired, uh, but that's not to say that I wanted to write like those writers, um, and but with this, as as you yourself must must know, because you're a writer yourself, uh, this does not remain fixed. Yeah. You know, at <clears throat> certain times, um, you know, some writers are important. Then you move on, and and so on, and and for in some cases, you actually turn completely against them and can, can't yeah, bear absolutely. to read them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Either um, it could either be because of something they do or say, or the. I'm thinking of somebody like V.S. Naipaul, for okay. example. Yeah. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, would have been a writer like that. Yeah. Uh, whose whose work I 
think I've read almost all of it or most of it and admired quite a lot of it um, until a certain point. I, I just couldn't read it anymore. Um, but there are many others. So it's a very difficult question um, and it always comes up. <laughs> you know, but it is a difficult question to answer because it, it's, it's asking you to say who, who are the important writers to you. And, and the truth is that um, there were many, there were so many and they're for different reasons and uh, not completely and fully, you know, kind of like em endorsed or em endorsing them or embracing them. Um, that is to say, you might like one book but not another. And, and it's only after a long experience, I think, that I'm, I'm, I can now kind of distill this into saying I love Dickens, uh, for example, which I wouldn't have been able to say. Mm -hmm. um, probably at the time, because I, I hadn't read enough Dickens. Yeah. Or I love the work of uh, John Kutzea, for example. Oh. So there are many others like this. Uh, I used to admire Saul Bellow very much, but there was a time when I was also like Naipaul, I just can't read Saul Bellow anymore. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's difficult in this way to, to have, a, as it were, a permanent list that you could point to. Yeah, I don't necessarily mean that. I think... Um I think about my experience as a writer, and when I began, there were a few writers that knocked me back completely. I remember quite vividly. For example, the first time I read uh, Kafka, uh, I was taken aback. And the reason why was because I recognized in Kafka the kinds of stories my parents had told me when I was growing up. Yeah, really? Okay. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And also, I recognized his unwillingness to kind of erect a line between fiction and nonfiction, again, resembled the, the stories that my father in particular told me when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And so I saw a kind of possibility for the kind of work I wanted to produce, recognizing all the while that eventually when I sort of uh, found the courage to write that I want to be writing what he, was, what he wrote, but that in a way it started me down the path. Um, and I think about him, and you're right, I think about Kafka and... Borges differently now than I did when I began to read them. But I think of them as people who kind of opened the door in a way. Yeah, okay. okay. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's great. That's good. I, I mean, I can probably also say there, there's this writer and that writer and that writer, but not, not quite as strongly as that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously Kafka. and One writer I, I, I really did like, but only one book that I could, and that was William Saroyan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if anybody has read William Saroyan because he's one of those writers who fell through the trap door at some point and, uh, and nobody reads him anymore. But I remember the, the, the daring young man on the flying trapeze uh, because it was written with such freedom. Yeah. And, and I really like that. I remember one of the things he says in one of those stories is if I wanted to write like James Joyce, I would write like James Joyce. I think probably not. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the point that he's saying, you know, I don't want to be James Joyce. I want yeah. to write like somebody else, like me. Um, so the, so for, with him, I love that attitude and the freedom of his writing, which I didn't find in any other of his books and others for different reasons and so on. But, but so I don't have that experience yeah. of, of a, a Borges or a Kafka that sort of I thought I wish I could do that. Although I did, of course, think I wish I could do that when I read Kafka, but not, <laughs> not I wish I could do that. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the present state of literature, the, li the literary ecosystem. Is it healthy? I think so. I mean, it certainly seems it's more varied. Um, as thinking of some years ago, maybe about 25 or so years ago in, in, in Britain anyway, and perhaps it was also true in the United States, there was really only a very small number of writers whose work was both taken seriously and was addressed seriously, say, in, in, the, in the arts pages and this kind of thing. Um, and those were the days when it would be, you know, um, uh, the names are kind of grown slightly hazy, but, you know, um, what's his name? Um, Ian McEwan. <laughs> Martin Amos. Martin Amos. 
my, yeah, my name is um, <laughs> Julian Barnes. <laughs> so, their work, they would be uh, all the time, uh, Salman Rushdie, th yeah. their work would be there, being spoken about all the time. And really other people kind of in the margin. I think there is much, much less of that now. Mm -hmm. And there is much more room for other writers. I don't mean minor writers either. I mean there is room for for variety, for different uh, kinds of writing. I'm not sure quite why that is. Maybe maybe the um, the outlets are different. You know, it isn't just newspapers yeah. and magazines. There are other places where where writing is spoken about. Um, I mean, the internet, the radio, and so on. Although all these were there, but the, somehow they only focus on a small number. And of course, there is now a great deal, um, you know, a great deal less of that preciousness about what is um, what is worth reading and what is yeah. not worth reading. Um, and there is self-publishing, mm -hmm. which at, at one time would have seemed like, um, well, you know, like something laughable. Yeah. But it isn't anymore. Um, in that people do it out of choice when they when they could be published by um, mainstream publishers, uh, and people do it knowing that, in some cases, knowing that the circulation would only be small, and uh, uh, and they they are happy to do that and happy to only have a small readership for the moment yeah. uh, until they hit the big time. Yeah. I ask because there's so much angst, I think, at least in this country, about you know streaming television and how much yeah, yeah. attention uh -huh. people are paying to that and, and movies and video games and the like. And okay. I think there's some fear that perhaps uh, literature doesn't, literature doesn't um, have that kind of prominence in the culture that it wants uh -huh. to. Okay, I didn't get that, yeah. that, that angle. I don't think so. I mean, I don't... It's as if to assume that before uh, everybody was reading... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is not the case, um, which was not the case, um, <laughs> and that now they're watching TV instead. I don't really think it's that. I think, I think readers are, oh, aren't you, You're obstinate and stubborn <laughs> and sticking to it. And yeah, I think that still goes on. Yeah, sure. Maybe this is not the best. It's not a representative audience here, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't know. No, I take your point. I take your point. Uh, so, I, as I mentioned before, I first encountered your work as a graduate student at Oxford. I was trying to find my way into the African literary canon. Um, and, of course, I'd heard a couple names growing up constantly, Shoinka, Achebe. Um, my parents are from Nigeria, and so they spoke a lot about those folks and some others as well. But uh, when I arrived at grad school, I was grappling with this idea that I wanted to be a writer. And I was also, as you kind of mentioned before, a little bit of afraid of that. And I was also doing a lot of writing in secret, and I wanted to get a sense of um, the writers who had come before and, and what they had written and how they had produced their work. And so I was kind of, I, I went to Oxford for grad school and I was uh, in my, my college library kind of looking around for books, and I came across your, I think it's called the Essays on African Writing series. Um, I believe you edited helped to edit two or three volumes of that. Um, two. Two, okay. And uh, so I, and I read them, and it, for me it was truly a revelation because uh, it was the kind of, first of all, in those books I got a broad sense of the writers uh, who were producing work and a sense of their careers, a sense of the themes and craft as well in those books. That was really important to me. It changed the way that I, I thought about the African literary canon um, and why it was important. And I think part of the reason it, it was so important to me was because of the seriousness with which you and others in those books, I remember you wrote the introduction to both of those uh, volumes and uh, the various critics and academics who wrote about writers, the seriousness with which they did that really appealed to me and uh, impacted me a great deal in my own trajectory as a writer. Um, so I'm saying all this to say that I came to know you initially through your criticism, through your academic work. And, and you've, you were an academic for many years, um, and you had a kind of parallel track as, as, a, as a writer. I'm wondering how your life as an academic and critic um, sort of interacts with your, your, your work, your life as a fiction writer, what the relationship between those two aspects of your working life is. Uh, 
Well, they were, <coughs> they were parallel rather than a kind of overlap, no, no, obviously, they would have done. But to me, they felt like sep separate activities. I mean, obviously, they are in the sense of writing an academic uh, piece uh, is a very different process from writing, a, from writing fiction uh, in almost every way. I mean, both in the process of doing it and in what you aim to achieve at the end of it. Um, I didn't feel that they interfered with each other in the sense that <clears throat> most of the time I was not teaching um, African writing, for mm -hmm. example. Um, or even later on when, when we kind of moved away from the regional notion and went on to talk about post-colonial writing. Because I was also teaching other things uh, which were nothing to do with that. I was, and also the activities were always happening at separate times. Yeah. Uh, so I, never, I almost never wrote fiction during term time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I almost never wrote fiction in my office at the university. Um, and Intentionally like or just? Uh, deliberately, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it, there were separate activities. Uh -huh. And I really, uh, I think, deliberately tried not to allow them to interfere too much with each other. And I don't think it was hard to do, because as I say, there were such different kinds of activities that it wasn't difficult to do. I suppose what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to uh, allow the fiction to sound like a lecture, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I th and I suppose I also didn't want the lecture to sound like fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Indeed. <laughs> but it wasn't hard. Uh, I've, I've, it's a question I've been asked uh, often, but to me, they really did seem like quite different things. Um, so when I retired from teaching, about five or so years ago, I retired from the university, I, I haven't done any of that kind of writing at all, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, they did seem manageable. It wasn't a problem. Yeah. Um. I've been reading a lot of reviews of Afterlives and some of your, uh, your prior novels, and I've noticed this trend that critics in the West have, and I wanted to know if you recognize this as well. Uh, there's a trend, I think, when um, critics in the West are describing, or let's say the Global North, they're talking about writers from the Global South, they'll um, sort of focus on uh, what you're meant to get from reading a book, you know, by, you know, so it's like almost as if you're taking your vitamins. If you read this book by this writer, you'll learn about colonialism, you'll learn about this war that's happening somewhere in Africa. There's less focus on the craft. Um, and it seems as if the larger conversations about craft are reserved oftentimes for writers from the global north, from America or the UK or somewhere else in Europe. I'm wondering if you have noticed that trend, and if so, how you feel about that? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I suppose I recognize what you're saying, but I haven't sensed that there is an absence of attention for other things that are happening. Um, it, it is, I think of, of literature, of writing, not as a practice, but as we consume it, I mean, uh, as we receive it. I think, of, I think that what we get out of it is a, a very complicated mixture of things, uh, or, or mixture is not the right word, a com complicated uh, uh, responses. So pleasure, and pleasure is not just simply because uh, we are entertained. Mm -hmm. Pleasure because in the same way as perhaps listening to a piece of music and being um, uh, pleased by its virtuosity, as mm -hmm. well as the melody, as well as everything else. And the same, I think, with when, when we're reading something that, that is well done, that, that pleases us, it's, it's not simply because it entertains us, but something else, something about the shape of the sentence or the formulation or something like that is satisfying, is pleasing. So there's that. There is the way in which we recognize ourselves in the writing. Um, say, yes, that's how I feel. I understand that, or I didn't, or perhaps not. 
or perhaps I didn't know that, yeah. uh, and I'm learning something about what it feels to be that. And also, finally, or at least one more uh, response that we have, is that it's news. I'm learning something about something I didn't know about. Now, it could be that in some cases, and maybe afterlives in some respects, in some respects is an example of that. I didn't know about that historical episode, um, say the 1914 war, or Deutsche Ost Africa, or something like that. Yeah. And it might be that the most, that might be the most prominent uh, feeling, or the most prominent way in which that writer or journalist or critic chooses to um, to receive the book. But I mean, I, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. But I think there is also, uh, I mean, one has to take into account that it may also be that um, it's part of the way in which that reader is coming to this work and, sure. and learning or receiving or hearing news uh, and that this is the thing that is the strongest, that makes the, the biggest impact. Um, but I do also think that that wouldn't be enough to say, I've just read a book by so-and-so and told me about this, he told me about that. The fact that you, I think, willing to, to, to respond to this book and to write about this book, probably, even if you're not making prominent the other aspects of it, it's because the other aspects are also there and also work. Yeah. To pivot for a moment to your, your novel, um, it's a big, kind of capacious book with uh, many characters across many generations. Um, how do you approach a work of this scope? Uh, to be more specific, um, so there's you know, war playing out in the background and, and the foreground of the novel as well, conflict, um, but then we also, you also zoom into the kind of intimate lives of your characters as well. Do you start with the characters and think about, um, you know, sort of placing them against this backdrop? Do you think about what you talk about, this conflict that you wish to discuss and think, well, let me come up with some characters who might inhabit this space? Or is it a combination of both? How does that come to you and how do you go about planning a novel like this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it comes. It comes? It, it comes by a series of, I think, accumulations of you know, the idea is this is, there is a, uh, obviously there is always a starting point, and, uh, <clears throat> but the starting point is not in writing for me, the starting point is in, you know, allowing the idea and adding to the ideas and, and these kind of like accrete as you were, they grow on each other, and then you think, aha, there is another way of thinking about this and another way of thinking about that. And so by the time you kind of meandered through all of this, you don't have to answer that question, <laughs> if you see what I mean, because, because they've already tangled themselves up with each other. Sure. I get that, but as you read, let's so, I'll just press you a little bit. As you read okay. through the drafts and you say, okay, well, you might have in mind something you wish to communicate to the reader. How do you go about turning the dial, the knob, you know, is it, do you understand what I'm saying? I do, I do, yeah. I do. And that's also part of the pleasure of it all, of course, yeah. that, that though you begin, as I've tried to describe, with this uh, series of possible ways of approaching this and approaching that and so on, but, you know, uh, a couple of months into what you're doing, or three months or four, you think, well, no, 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 maybe not, maybe not, maybe <laughs> wait. Let's, I'll give you a, a concrete example sure. from, from Afterlives. The very first thing I started to write after lives in Stellenbosch, actually, when we were there on that uh, wonderful period um, of months in South Africa. Mm -hmm. The very first thing I wrote, the first day I was sitting there in my office, is the passage of, um, which is now part three of the novel, where Hamza returns to the town yep. and the harbor, the, you know, the boat coming into harbor and all that kind of thing. That's what I began with. Because my thinking at that point was that this uh, person would arrive into the town, in the, to the town from the war. Um, he used to live there, but you know, only kind of vaguely lived there. He didn't grow up there. Um, and he would meet, in due course, Afia, 
who also has you know, traumatic experiences of her own that she's going through. And they would, in, sooner or later, come together and in the process kind of reflect on their lives. So in other words, it was going to be retelling the, their stories. But then I thought, after I'd written up some of this, I thought, no, 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 we'll make it happen. Mm. So the reader knows their story. Yeah. And so that by the time we get to that moment when Hamza is coming to town, we know what he's been through and what he's done. Uh, well, that's the kind of shifting and adjusting and so on, which is, um, well, which is part of the pleasure of doing it. Yeah. Um, I see you're getting the signal from yeah. someone. <laughs> I'm being very careful when I talk about your book because I remember quite vividly one time I was in this very space. This was a few years ago. And I, who was here? I think it was Zadie Smith. It was, she was talking about uh, N.W., her novel, and, and the person who was interviewing her uh, divulged some aspect of the plot and the, the groans that everybody was upset and beside themselves. So I learned an important lesson that day, which is you know, to talk about the novel as, as generally as possible. Because, but I say that to say that it's an incredible novel, um, and I hope that all of you have a chance to read it soon. Um, you mentioned the signal. Uh, so I'm going to ask one more question and then ask those of you who have questions to please approach one of these microphones and we can start the kind of audience question portion of this uh, event. But I, I want to turn back to your lecture. There was, uh, towards the end of your lecture, you said something that I found quite moving and compelling. I want to read it to you and then ask you a question based on it. You say, but writing cannot be just about battling and polemics, however invigorating and comforting that can be. Writing is not about one thing, not about this issue or that, or this concern or another. And since its concern is human life in one way or another, sooner or later, cruelty and love and weakness become its subject. I believe that writing also has to show what can be otherwise, what it is that the hard, domineering eye cannot see, what makes people apparently small in stature feel assured in themselves, regardless of the disdain of others. So I found it necessary to write about that as well and to do so truthfully so that both the ugliness and the virtue come through and the human being appears out of the simplification and stereotype. When that works, a kind of beauty comes out of it. Um, so the question I'm, I, I want to ask you is related to how I think about or something I'm trying to work through as I write as well. Um, because I, I also, I have, uh, I have deeply held sort of passions and political beliefs and certain things I hope to communicate in the writing, but I also am deeply interested in aesthetics uh, and beauty, the beauty of a sentence, the beauty of a paragraph, uh, the idea that uh, a reader should pick up a book and enjoy it and derive something pleasurable from that experience as you've just described. So how do you, de how do you balance the desire to battle polemics um, as you put it in your piece, uh, with that, with that, how do you, with, with that hard domineering eye that you cannot see, um, how do you balance that sort of desire to create the beautiful sentence, um, to transmit beauty to the reader, and also as a reader is sitting back and think, taking in that beauty to kind of simultaneously show them the world, show them what is actually happening compel them to respond to it. <laughs> I wish I could say there was a simple way of doing it or of, of how that is achieved. I think, I think you learn to hear um, a, a false note. You know? Yeah. Um, both uh, false, I mean, I think this is this is writing practice, as I see it. Yeah. That um, that <clears throat> a false note, both in human terms, um, an intolerant th uh, thought or emotion that you're introducing into the work. Yeah. Um, an overstatement, a cruelty, um, or lack of generosity. So I think you. That's, that's what, for me, is what I do when I edit what I'm doing. So that's what I mean by a false note. Like, I suppose, uh, again, I'm a composer, I suppose, might write a piece and I think, no, no, something's not right, and whatever it is, that's, you can hear it. And I think 
for me anyway, that with that is what writing and revising is about. Yeah. Hearing and seeing. For me, I hear also when I read. When I read what I write, I also somehow I can think I can hear it. Um, and yeah, and so you hear the f where where what you're writing is false or what you're writing is of the of the caliber of that that domineering tone of voice or the ungenerous way of seeing something. Yeah. That's really all I can say. I don't know what else is goes in the practice aside from just kind of um, being critical, learning to, to read critically, right, learning to read what you write critically. Yeah, that makes sense. Any questions? I see, yeah. Please. Sorry, I'll start off. Sure. Thank you for your body of work and Thank talking you. to us today. Um, this is a hard question, but um, if you were asked to write a eulogy for Queen Elizabeth II, what would you say? No. <laughs> what insights would you provide if you were forced to? I wouldn't be forced to. Who would force me? <laughs> I think, I don't know what your question, what is behind your question, but I know and understand that there are many people in the United Kingdom in particular who love their queen and are are uh, very sad about her passing, and I respect that. But I have nothing to add to that. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Ife, and I'm currently a junior at Harvard studying English and writing. And my question is, um, um, upon the Nobel Lecture, um, there was a line that, took, that I took note of. It says, I agree with your writing refusal of the self-assured summaries of people who despised and belittled us. Um, some of the things um, in that had been explored in the course of today's talk, but um, after um, the death of um, Queen Elizabeth, there's, there, there's been conversations about imperialism and um, how um, Africans and African literature have being despised for centuries. And my question is, um, what, what do you consider to be um, the greatest thing that you've come across in terms of that sense of assurance as a writer? Or what, what gives you a, a sense of assurance? Um, because I, I've come to um, ad admire your prisoner in terms of how assured your voice, both in writing and in person is. So my question is basically asking, um, what assures you the most as a writer, and what satisfies you when you write? Is it getting published? Is it just the joy of the writing itself? What, what, what's the major source of assurance for you? Uh, I think when writing is like, I, I often think of it in terms of like a, an athlete. Uh, you have, you have a, a, a talent, which you train to develop, you work at it, and once you start to do that, you are kind of hooked into that. And what pleasure do you think an athlete gets? It isn't simply winning the race, it's probably all of those things, the training, knowing that, that, that there is a talent which he or she is developing and fulfilling something in the process. But of course, writing is also about articulating ideas and reflections and disseminating them and all of those kinds of things. So I think it's all of those things that make it uh, worth doing that gives me the greatest pleasure. If on top of that, then people read what I write. Uh -huh. so, so that is another pleasure of a different kind. If they then not only do that, but they then say such wonderful things uh, as this, or they even give you a, uh, an award and all of that, that too is part of it. But believe me, it's not the reason for doing it, and it's not the reason for sustaining the, you know, the labor of doing it. But it does help to keep you going. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for the response. 
I find that um, very a great response because there's a tendency as one well as writers start to get established or start to have their work out to just become sort of self-conscious and I'm curious as to um, how you can bet that and I think that was a great response, so thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Sure. Thank you so much, both of you, for being here, sharing your time and your words. Um, I just remember for a few days after reading Gravel Heart, having a sort of heightened sensitivity and interest in the stories of those around me. And I think that was due in large part to the um, care and honoring the complexity and dignity of the characters within that novel. Thank and you. it reminded me of how reading literature is an exercise in compassion. And I'm wondering to what extent that writing literature for you is a, can serve as an exercise in compassion as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, very much so. Um, because in the process of uh, um, trying to, to make clear, to dramatize the lives of people, uh, I find it's um, almost impossible not to enter into their lives, even though they're an invention, they're not real people. Uh, but they become more real because you don't think of them as just figures in a book. You think of them uh, as people living their lives. I don't think this is a matter of identification. I think this is a matter of actually absorbing uh, the, 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 the dilemmas and dramas of others, as it were. I guess it's what we think of as ima imagination. And we do it ourselves. You don't have to be a writer to do that. You do it in order to understand uh, an encounter with somebody by putting yourself in their position in some way and trying to say, what's, up, what's wrong with him? That kind of thing. Well, it's not always what's wrong with him, but what is it that motivates certain kinds of activities, certain kinds of decisions, um, or sometimes a perplexity. You know, I don't understand why somebody might do a thing like that. But you don't stop there. If you're going to be a writer, you then have to say, well, how come he did? And so in that respect, you actually have to enter into people's lives, or even when I say people's lives, I mean imagine people's lives that you then have to kind of... So it's that. So sure, if that's what you mean, then sharing or uh, having compassion for people, because otherwise you can't truthfully, but even for yourself, I mean, say truthfully to your own truths, uh, speak about them or write about them or deliver them if you have not done that process of actually entering their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few questions from our virtual audience, so I'm going to ask one and then I'll go to you. Um, Carol Ann in Washington, D.C. asks, she says, your portrayal of female characters is compassionate and rich. How are you able to do so much in women's minds and give them such sympathy in your novels? <laughs> well, no, actually, I, 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 again, I would have to say I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I grew up, I grew up with uh, four sisters. I don't know if okay. that's, a, um, if that's. I a, hear an O in the audience. I would say, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I don't there know if go. that's any help. Uh, and of course, I grew up with a mother and an aunt and yeah, whatever, you know. Sure. Uh, so they're all those. Uh, so it doesn't seem to me. Um, difficult to have an understanding. Of course, um, of course, um, I, I, a woman would have a much fuller understanding of what it is to be a woman, but mm -hmm. it's not impossible to have some understanding mm -hmm. uh, of um, how a woman, in the same way as a man. Um, so I take it as a, as a compliment that a, a compliment. woman would yeah. say that. <laughs> But I'd, I'd better just not say any more about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well played, good sir, well played. Please. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, my question is, I'm curious about what your writing process is like and what sort of rituals you follow as a writer. Do you wake up really early in the morning and write? Do you follow, a, a, reach a certain word count before you finish? Do you lock yourself away in a cabin and write until you can't stop? I'm just curious what that is like and if that has changed at all uh, since you've uh, retired from academia. Thank are, you. are you a writer? Try to be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, I mean, everybody has their own way of doing these things, of course, I would imagine, anyway. Uh, if, it, when I'm in the process of writing, rather than um, 
maybe making notes or reading or catching up, doing research, but if I'm actually writing, but even so, I would try uh, that, that as soon as I'm up, as you were, so by eight o'clock or so, I, sh I should be at my desk. That's how I like it. Um, and work until possibly mid-afternoon, with a break, of course, to eat something. Uh, um, that's assuming there is nothing else, because life is complicated. Sometimes there are other things to do. But if there is nothing else uh, making demands, then how I would like it to be is that I would work uh, like that. <clears throat> I, I like to stop working, not necessarily because I'm exhausted, um, but I like to stop working when I know what the next section is going to be, what, the, what tomorrow's next page is going to be. I like doing that, so I stop when I feel I know what's going to happen next. It gives me time to think a little more about it, but it also means when I sit down at my desk the next day, I, I don't have to just sit there for hours staring at the computer. <laughs> It means I can actually get going with something after I've, probably I would spend the first couple of hours revising the previous day's writing before moving on, and then I'd pick up where I'd stopped. So it means it always feels like I'm making progress. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please. Hello. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be, to be meeting Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, August 30th, I received After Lies in the mail from the usual source uh, <laughs> in America, Amazon. Um, <laughs> and uh, I gave myself a homework assignment, to read it before I was able to be here tonight. Uh, luckily, I, I did finish it on Sunday. And just a compliment and just a comment to those in the audience who may not have yet read it, read it. It's one of the best novels I've read in my life. It's one of those novels that not only at the end do I say, oh, I wish there were more, but in the days since Sunday, it's never left my consciousness. Um, and it, I predicted it'll probably be put on my shelf with just a few other books that I think can, changes me. There is uh, an incident in the book that did something extraordinary to me and I think other, other writers, uh, other readers have had this from time to time, but only from books that somehow have that magic to allow you to, yes, enter into the lives of the people and think of them as real. Uh, it is, and I won't give any, any details away, with an incidence of cruelty and violence by a man against a young woman. Mm -hmm. uh, Every, everybody reads quietly, but at that moment, that's a moment when I, as a reader, had to actually, you know, viscerally react to that, to, to say, essentially, oh my God, uh, that's the, I just wanted to mention, that's the power of this, this writer's writer, writing. Um, what happened to me when I read that is I kind of wanted, I, I needed to escape and I found myself looking at the physical book in front of me, which had disappeared. With most readers, it disappears as you read something of like Dickens or, or other great writers. And I was looking at the page, and there when, that, when you have written about that incident, it's just a few sentences at the culmination of an event. And so I'm looking at these few sentences, these few words, and I'm just saying, how does this magic appear? How, 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 does, how did you create the magic to be able to make that incident so real to me? And I, I predict it'll be real to everybody else who reads the novel. Oh, it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I thought you didn't have a question. I thought you were going to do that. And I was quite happy to listen to that. I thought, yeah. <laughs> Keep going, you're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, let, let me ask it then in the form of a question. Um, <laughs> did you write that and then maybe share the drafts of this with other people and they indicated 
that this is a powerful point in the novel? But, and did no. You, what did, I, I guess, um, because I just phrased it as, as something magical, can you pierce through the magic and, and just for self say, how did I get there? How did, how did that happen? It, not any, in any particular special way. I mean, I'm, of course, uh, grateful for all the very nice things you said. And, but people, I think, uh, I couldn't have guessed what you're, what, you're going, what you're going to be referring to when you're saying there was one moment. Um, because uh, I promise you, uh, last night I was talking to somebody uh, we were talking with somebody who described a wholly different place in the, in the novel in a very similar way. <laughs> so when you started to speak, I thought, oh, maybe it's that, that moment. But it isn't. It was something else that you're talking about. So it may be also to do with the way it reached you uh, in a particular way. Um, I don't think... I think I know the incident you're talking about, which is Afia's... Um, the, the guardian father type figure... Uh, when he um, is cruel to her. Yeah. Um, but I suppose what I was trying to do was not... There's something about um, the way that uh, fathers or men uh, treat small children. I mean, some, of course, not all. And perhaps not by any means, many. But, but when uh, strong men uh, allow themselves to, to hit, to hit very hard small children, then I think they go over a certain kind of uh, inhumanity, as it were, a certain line. Um, and they seem, in my view, seem to be unable to control themselves, that they are... Uh, that they beat up little children. You think, you know, a, little, a small child, you'd think even a little push would be painful enough, or a little smack. But when somebody really goes to town on a child, then you think something inhuman has taken place. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to convey in that scene. By the way, uh, William Savoyan's The Human Comedy was mandatory reading for me in junior high school. Does it? Yes. That would have been mid late sixties. Yeah. So uh, continue your campaign, campaign, and it was wonderful. It's a <laughs> wonderful double. And, and what about the daring young man? I confess I have not read that. I will be reading that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> homework. <laughs> you leave it with homework. Go on. Let's allow Thank somebody you. else to, to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just take these last three questions. Shikamo. Shikamo, oh, marhaba. It's such an honor to be in your presence, and I have enjoyed all your 10 books, and I had to order them from overseas, because when uh, your name uh, featured on that noble morning announcement, they were nowhere to be found in the area uh, where I lived. So I've enjoyed them so much, and I wanted to ask you, when is your next book coming out? But <laughs> I'm pretty sure it will come out, and that uh, it will be there, and I will be there, uh, looking forward to it. So my question instead is, earlier this evening you said in bypassing, oh, that was when I was working in the hospital. Well, in one of your books, the character is working in a hospital. So I wonder which one or two or three of your books are the most autobiographical? <laughs> None of them. <laughs> <laughs> But I think when, when uh, a lot of writers, when they, <clears throat> certainly this was true of me, when they start off, they often rely on their more, most immediate aches and pains and um, experience, perhaps their lives as well. Not to say that it's a, a memoir, but the experiences I think that figure probably prominently uh, are experiences they themselves have been through or have heard about in a fairly intimate sort of way. Um, so I suppose, in some ways, the experience of working in a hospital worked it, found its way into that novel. 
but um, but not the actual events that happened that happened to Dawood and uh, and the young woman, the nurse, young woman, and all that. You know, no, no, that was, and no, no, the f some of the friends, some because when you're writing something like that, which is about, as you say, autobiographical, then there are always other people who kind of read it in that way and say, so is that me? <laughs> <laughs> what have you done with me? And this kind of thing. But it's not. Hi, Salam. Uh, my name is Zina, and I have a question for you about permission. Uh, about? I'm, permission. Permission, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm from Sudan, and similar to you, I've always fantasized about writing my way home through fiction. But I have a lot of anxiety about uh, in knowing that any work that comes out about Sudanese history, which is often under or misrepresented completely, may be regarded as nonfiction or taken as historical fact. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice about giving yourself permission to uh -huh. fictionalize and dramatize certain <clears throat> histories. Uh, well, you, I think you, as the, as the individual, will have to judge how far you think you can go with that. Um, there, there are many different things that might happen if you're, if you're, if you're going to write about um, a play. People have their own sensitivities, and you have your own as well as, as, well as a writer, so you have to make the judgment, I think. Uh, do I dare offend? Uh, is it necessary to do so? If it's necessary, then you've got to do it. Uh, but if it's... Uh, if... Um, well, some writers offend because they want to, regardless whether it's necessary to do so or not, because that's, that's part of the aesthetic, as it were, that they wish to embrace. Um, but uh, if I understand your sensitivity, then... If you can't do it, then obviously you can't. But writing offends. It will offend somebody, particularly if they feel that there are, as it were, family secrets being revealed in the process. So either you grit your teeth and get on with it, or do something else. Thank you. Well. Hi. Hello. Jumbo Sana. Oh, hi. I'm from DRC. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, I would like to know how were your writings were received in your country of origin, Tanzania, and if you have a, a Swahili version of your books. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the last question is easy to answer at last because it's only now, in fact, later this month, that the first translation of Paradise in the Swahili will appear. The first translation of any of my work will appear. Um, this is partly because the publishing business in, in Tanzania is um, in a very poor, 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 poor state. Uh, and uh, the reading um, habit, as it were, the, the reading culture is also hardly existent. People read because they're told to read for school, and very few people read for pleasure. I mean pleasure in the full sense of that word. I don't mean pleasure just for entertainment. Some people do read for entertainment, but then they read things that are intended for entertainment, like um, you know, romances or uh, certain kinds of genre fiction and so on. Um, I haven't had any bad experience of being read. Those who read seem to be quite happy with it. And of course, uh, since the award, um, since last October, I have been fully embraced um, by by Sansipa. <laughs> um, and they're very happy with me. <laughs> so, uh, but I have in any case, even though I have not to answer your question, I'm sorry, you've disappeared. Yeah. Is it Salma? Salama? Ah, uh, there you are, yeah. To answer your question. Even though during my writing, I have in, indeed uh, done exactly what you're afraid of, which is to write things that I did ask myself the question, is this wise? Because will it be safe for me next time I, uh, I visit Zanzibar and so on? 
But I guess that may be part of the answer to your question. They obviously didn't read the books. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> On that note, thank you so much for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you for coming out. We appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Abdul Razak Gurna and Tope Falarin. If everyone can please stay seated for just a minute while our guests make their way backstage. Um, autograph books from both authors are for sale in the main lobby, and you can also exit using the main lobby where you came in. Um, please do not go downstairs to exit. All exits are upstairs, um, but there is a restroom downstairs if you need that. Thank you so much.